My name's Alex, I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Drug and Alcohol Services South Australia. I've been with the organisation for what, a while, but quite importantly, my position is one of the lived experience position. Um, and so people in this role need to be there experience themselves or support somebody else uh, with their journey uh, and experience with alcohol and drugs. Uh, my name, oh, sorry, um, my name is Tanil. I am a community representative with DASA and, uh, and like Alex, I bring a lived experience element to, um, to my position as a community representative and also obviously represent pockets of the community within South Australia. So I'm just going to give a really brief run now for a bit of our journey. Um, uh, getting to the point that we're currently at. And the main focus that we're bringing today is about how we've prepared the organisation and, and preparing people to actively participate as equal partners within the organisation as well. So DASA has a long history of engagement in a range of different areas and in some areas we've done it very well. But what we what we come to find out is that it's not universal, it wasn't comprehensive and we were falling behind the eight ball um, both nationally and internationally. In 2014, we made a decision uh, to really be on the front foot and if we were going to do engagement and participation, we wanted to do it well and we wanted to do it right. Um, so this is just a very brief overview. We're only really scratching the surface of a lot of systems that uh, we've developed uh, through the way and on the back table is some resources, our information, our, our guidelines for community members and staff and an overview of different things. So please feel free to grab anything from the table. What it meant for us, because it was quite a change, um, welcoming community members into the organisation was something that we hadn't done uh, comprehensively before. So we needed to create some fertile soil. It meant we did a lot of learning from others who worked the path before us. We spoke to ex experts in the field. Uh, we partnered with the Health Consumers Alliance, who you'll be hearing from uh, in a little while. And we looked internationally at different examples of what worked well and what didn't work in some way. We identified our key drivers why we were doing this, and there were three key drivers. One, which I'm sure is no surprise to you, is that it works. All the evidence would tell us that if we had meaningful and robust systems for engagement and participation, we were going to get better outcomes. We also, there's a lot of evidence to say that if those systems aren't robust, if they aren't comprehensive, and if people aren't empowered to um, be partners on the individual or the systems level, then uh, negative experiences can follow. There's lots of international experience. Uh, examples for that. We also went through accreditation as a health service and back in 2013 we didn't do well when it came to engagement and participation and, and that is you know part of holding us accountable and last week we had our accreditation and, and we're very pleased to know that we've met it and been considered for met with America so we've made some considerable steps uh, in the right direction. We established systems to support mechanisms to recruit and duck community members and we spent a lot of time preparing our work for this. And this is what we ended up with. So we did a range of conversations, uh, we went out with a proposal which we quite changed quite radically um, and now we've ended up with our community partnership program. So DAS has got a goal to be a community centred, transparent, open and welcoming organisation who actively partners with and listens to the experience of its community. And that is clients, carers and others using our services. We do it in four ways. We have active representation, which Tanil will talk a little bit more about. Um, and that is at all levels of the organisation. Um, our executive group that meets on a weekly basis has a community advocate position there, right through uh, all of our programs. We measure community experience. We've been doing some work redeveloping our uh, client satisfaction survey so that it not only reaches people who are easy to reach, who are in our inpatient settings, who we can easily talk to, but is actually statewide and representative of people from Mount Gambia through to the Abu Islands and everywhere in between. We redeveloped our feedback system and, and our um, feedback pamphlets on that um, because we wanted to open it so that people not only provide us a complaint but also could provide advice and suggestions and compliments. But more than that, that we would actually do something with it and we would get back to people more closely um, and continuous quality improvement taking that mantra of we asked, you said and we did. And finally, remembering that the community member is the most important person in the room. We are, after all, a public service agency. So, um, who is the community? So, when Dasa are talking about our community, um, it sort of is made up of clients, so past, present, uh, or people who are eligible to use the services. 
carers for those people, so dependents, partners, um, family members of, of people who um, could be clients, and anybody who has an interest in or is impacted by alcohol, tobacco and other drug policies. And, um, and at DASA, we say community rather than, um, rather than a consumer, uh, very deliberately. And, um, and that sort of got some links to language that's used within the drug and alcohol community. And, um, and so, yeah, so we, we definitely use the word community member in, instead of um, consumer. Um, yeah, so roles within DASA, we have a couple of different levels of participation and a couple of ways in which people can engage. And, um, and so community participants are inducted and trained community members that um, participate and provide advice through their own lived experience. Um, so they can do lived experience presentations, participate in forums, sit on topic-based panels. And, um, and at the moment we have community members conducting client satisfaction surveys as well. Um, and then there are community representatives such as myself and, um, and so in addition to the things that, that can be done by community participants, um, members like me represent the experience of particular subsets of the, um, subsets of the community and, um, and the activities there can um, include facilitating engagements and training. So I myself have taken part um, in working with HCA and Alex to develop um, community participation and engagement training um, for DASA. Um, sit on strategic committees um, as a community, community advocate and like Alex said, um, the, there is a position for a consumer advocate on um, the executive group, which meets weekly, and, um, and participating in staff recruitment panels. There's, there's a number of opportunity, other opportunities as well, but we had to sort of narrow it down for the purposes of meeting our time limits. Um, the Community Advisory Council has been something that has been a work in progress over the last probably 18 months, and this is the model that we work by for the Community Advisory Council. So um, once every month, um, community representatives, the community partnership program staff, being Alex and, um, and another woman, and um, the manager for safety and quality and the state and clinical directors of DASA come together to consider um, the yeah, performance data, safety and quality data, topic based panel recommendations, feedback, etc., so that um, it can come out as advice for advice to executive, um, advice to the clinical exec. Um, advice to SA Health and so we're looking at using all of this information and community input to be able to, um, to have impact on, on the provision of, of drug and alcohol services in South Australia. This is Alex. <laughs> One of the real challenges that we face um, as a service is the diversity of that community. Um, it's not only cultural diversity, age, gender, it's also people's relationship with alcohol and other drugs. And, um, and we had to do a lot of work uh, building the capacity of our staff to really be open to all the, all the different uh, views um, because in one way or another, the decisions of the organisation impact everybody in this room. Um, and we really wanted to use that community to break down the stereotype of what a client was. You know, some of our staff had a negative experience with clients and when we started talking about having a client being, uh, or someone who's experienced um, being a service user on an interview panel, we had a lot of pushback. You know, and so we had to dispel a lot of myths. We had to go out and use um, engagement champions and, and train our workforce. And one of the really big strengths is that we made a mandatory training, um, a three-hour face-to-face training, which is something that Neil and I have facilitated now to over 82% of the workforce. And that's made a really big impact. Um, and creating that opportunity for people to not only look at where we need to go, but also recognise how they already do a really good job within their local areas at partnering with people. And that might be clinically within you know, someone's own treatment, um, or it could be a lot broader than that. So to demonstrate... How long did that process take you with Yeah, so we... It was mid-2015 that we started developing the training module. It took a couple of months to develop. And then we had quite an intense um, delivery program and, and over about eight weeks we did 13 sessions across different areas of DASA um, and it's continued uh, thereafter. We wanted to do it in a short succession to have quite a large impact so that we could roll everything out. And we, and we did the training prior to officially launching the community partnership program. 
All right, so with role plays, what generally happens is that there's a couple of keen people and everyone else kind of sits back and avoids contact and start turning on each other, and so we, we know that's the case. But despite that, we need five volunteers. So this is, an actual, this is actually an activity that we use in our training, and so that's why we decided to sort of bring it today and to have people do it today. So we'll open auditions. There are five <laughs> positions available for any aspiring actors or someone who hasn't quite had the opportunity to live their dream. Um, yes, so we have Margaret, who is the chairperson or director of medicine. Is anyone an aspiring Margaret? <laughs> we hear all the all the all the, all the options. options. <laughs> <laughs> we've got about five minutes for yeah. you guys to finish this up. So let's just jump yeah. in there, folks. Like jump yeah. down the front. I'll leave one for yeah. you, can we? Right. So we have a Tony, manager of clinical services. We have a Tony. Oh, we've got two Tonys. Happy <laughs> Tony, thank you. And we also have a Maria, quality manager. Would you like to be Maria? Thank you very much. So this role play is very much about inclusive practice. Um, because one thing that most of you know that when you start sitting around a committee for some time, you start talking in acronyms. We have Tim, community representative. I'm looking around the back of the room. It, it can be Tina if you like, but we're happy with Tim. Okay, and one more, and that is Sam, Senior Research Consultant. Oh, thank you so much. So everyone just needs to read their section um, and remember who they are. We will have to use the microphone, so I will pass the microphone to Margaret. You're welcome. Look, it's great that you're here, Tim. As you were saying, it's important that we understand as a service how clients' lives are improving. Our next item is about our project on measuring client outcomes. We've just started and we're looking to develop a framework across the whole service. Sam's reporting on it. How's the framework going, Sam? Sam? Uh, well, we were just talking to Sam about the framework. Yeah. While we were just talking before about how the client measures fit together, we've got the map and the ATOM as key global tools and the general health instruments include the SF36 and the GAF. These are well known and should work well across our cohorts. What about the HONOPS? That's used nationally, isn't it? Uh, yes, in mental health, I think part of case mix, a good psychometric. <laughs> I was wondering, can we use any of these for pretests as well? I think we can, for instance, an ATOM. <laughs> What's an ATOM? Um, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> What's an ATOM? <laughs> sorry, Tim, I meant it's a name of a tool. Um, the Australian <laughs> Alcohol Treatment Outcome Measure. Sorry, Margaret. A very good, good tool, too. Pretty good validity and reliability. I heard Victoria's taken it up in preference to the BTOM. What about severity instruments? We think we are going with the CPQ and ADS. Tony and I have been weighing using the SDS or the SDSS. We're a bit stuck here. So, who's been in a meeting like this before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the SDS has better interrupt our standards. Okay. Sounds like you two have some work to do. Can you set up a table of your different measures? What the measures and the advantages and disadvantages of each for our next meeting? QS5. Don't forget to tie in with the MSQHS and the NMWH standards. These are relevant to the outcomes too. But what about the client's story? What about their outcomes? How does that get heard? All right, we might, we might close it there because we're running out of time. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this generally starts a discussion and we have staff in the room that says, oh, I felt like that too, and, and we really flesh out, well, the things we need to think about when we're welcoming people who are not part of the organisation to be active partners, because it has to be an equal uh, opportunity for us to get the results that we want. Yeah, and so... 
on that. Um, I just wanted to quickly speak about what participation has felt like for me as someone who has come in as a community member and, and engages in, in DASA. And, um, and I can certainly say that I do feel quite equal when I come into the room. As I said earlier, I've, I've taken part in, um, in co-facilitating and, and doing and developing the training and been on the executive committee and those sorts of things. And, um, and I've always felt valued and, and really heard. And I think that there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. And, um, and, I, and as I said, I have participated in other things as well, and it is always the case. And, um, and I believe that creating meaningful opportunities for engagement is a part of that. And, um, and also the changing culture that has taken place that's um, within DASA as well. So when we first started training, we were make, met with a little bit of resistance and, and there was a lot of discussion around the why why they having the opportunity to speak when we don't and really looking at really looking at those, those attitudes and being able to shift those. And, um, and now it's interesting now because I think as my confidence has grown, um, doing the training within DASA and participating within DASA, it's really it is also my presence within DASA has normalised, and um, and I think that that's a really important part of participation is that I'm no longer oh just to kneel the community rep who does the training. I'm I'm at DASA quite often, and um, and floating around we have hot desks. I have um, an SA Health email, so I have access to online training resources and all of those sorts of things just as staff would. Um, I have a mentor as well, so if if I need help preparing for any events or any of those sorts of things and I have that as well, as well as the opportunity to be able to debrief. Um, there is those structured support systems in place and I think that that's really important as well, be that the, there's um, remittance that people get, as I said, there's mentoring, there's, um, there are systems in place for, for the support of people who want to participate or to be a representative and meeting people where they're at in terms of what kind of engagement they want to be involved in I think is another really important part of um, of community members being able to come in and feel um, and feel safe and feel comfortable and, and to feel included in the process of engagement and and creating a space where um, people feel that they that they will be heard and um, and so that really comes down to the individuals in the room as well so having a really good chair is a part of that and having staff members around the table who are really really open to hearing what community members have to say and giving them space and time to be able to complete their thoughts and, and actually contribute and if you're having community members who are a little bit more quiet or standoffish inviting them to speak you know and if they and if people aren't comfortable speaking in a forum like this for example then finding a space where they will be and um, whether that be you know through written feedback or through one-on-one -on -one sessions for something different then um, then yeah really meeting people where they're comfortable um, would you like to yeah, so just, just in, in closing because we are now right into um, time um, one thing that I think is really important and really essential within organisations is to have a variety of opportunities for people. We have 64 community members who are on our register who come in, have the opportunity to come in, and not all of them want to be as involved as Tineo. And so there's a, a, a range of different options, and some of those are outlined in the resources at the back. But you know, being community centred in participation also means providing different options. Um, we'll hang around afterwards and we're going to lunch, so there'll be plenty of time to discuss this stuff. Directly over um, while Michael's setting up, he's the Chief Executive of the Health Consumers Alliance of South Australia. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the process we, we led to establish <coughs> a Consumer Communication Committee for Transforming Health. I'll outline what Transforming Health is, I'll outline some of the challenges and opportunities involved and also um, finish with uh, some of the critical success factors or enabling factors that uh, we've identified through this process. So I also acknowledge that we're meeting on Ghana land and pay my respects to all this past and present and also acknowledge their important connection to land. So Health Consumers Alliance, we're a peak body, we're funded by SA Health, our health department here in South Australia. And we've got a, mission, a vision around getting consumers to be at the heart of healthcare. And uh, our mission is to be a strong and effective voice for consumers. Um, there's a lot of evidence about the importance of consumer participation in health. There's a, a quote that uh, provides some of that evidence. And it continues, and I've also put there the, the source for that. It's the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Importantly, they have identified um, the, 
that uh, partnering with consumers is such an important aspect of uh, delivering a quality health service that they've uh, ensconced that in a national standard that uh, health services are required to be accredited against, and that's standard number two, partnering with consumers. Um, the setting is, unfortunately, uh, state states don't uh, have to meet those standards, so, so there has been a culture of, uh, of discomfort and, and, uh, and viewing that their decisions don't need to abide by the national safety and quality standards for, um, for, health, consumer, for uh, health services, and so they don't have to meet that standard. Um, Transforming Health is a major program to reorganise our metropolitan hospitals in South Australia, in Adelaide. Um, and the reasons being that um, they did a review of uh, what's happening in South Australia. Um, uh, that we found out we had more highest number of doctors, nurses on hospital beds and the greatest expenditure per head of population. Yet we weren't getting the, the, the best possible health outcomes for, for that expenditure. Um, governments and clinicians determined the need to realign the metropolitan hospital system. Uh, to increase investment in the three major hospitals, to realign three smaller hospitals, to focus on procedures, rehabilitation and palliative care, and also to develop new models of care to meet um, community expectations and also contemporary clinical standards. Some of the community expectations that weren't being met included things like having a, in a major uh, city like Adelaide, of having a 24 hours, seven day a week health service. Um, in fact, there were significant clinical disparities between when you were admitted. So if you're admitted after six o'clock on a weeknight or after or on the weekend, um, your your health outcomes were diminished because of that, because of access to, to significant uh, medical services, but also other sort of important services such as allied health. Um, so we didn't have a 24 hour, seven day a week health service here in South Australia. And uh, that's certainly not what the community expects and not what you expect when you're paying the most per head of population for that health service. When I'm talking about health service, I'm really talking about the uh, major public hospitals in, in Adelaide, not, um, not private hospitals nor um, in, in countries like Australia. Um, the timeline, uh, <coughs> this was really kicked off by the May 2014 federal budget, which um, foreshadowed significant budget cuts. Uh, quickly on, the minister here decided that um, he needed to engage clinicians in, in looking at what they would do about those budget cuts. There was in October there was a discussion paper. In November, uh, we held our first uh, consumer forum as a, the Health Consumers Alliance, and then there was a, a, a summit of all, of interested people, and the public was invited, and there was attended by 600 clinicians, administrators, uh, my organisation, some of our consumer representatives, and and uh, people from the general public. Um, a proposal paper came out of that summit, uh, Next Steps paper, and then we held our second consumer forum. And then in July, um, we were invited to join the Ministerial Clinical Advisory Group and the Consumer Engagement Committee was established. That time frame shows you there's a good year of um, development work um, where clinician engagement was quite high, uh, but engagement with consumers was, was pretty minimal uh, from the state government. So it kind of gives you a picture of uh, of the discomfort that uh, the head office of, of SA Health had around consumer engagement. Uh, the committee's been running for a year now and um, most recently in June we, we reviewed the committee and I'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, so at the second consumer community workshop we, um, we, we looked at, uh, we had some briefings from the minister and from senior SA Health staff. We had over 90 participants there, a mixture of consumers, community members, uh, clinicians and administrators uh, and I'd have to say over half the people in the room I, I wasn't familiar with uh, and I've worked in this sector for four and a half years so, so there was good, uh, a good cross-section of, of people and also new faces here which is quite important. Uh, through that process it was a three hour session plus lunch. Um, after the briefing we spent two hours uh, working with uh, the community to develop principles uh, selection criteria for the committee having a look at what, what the membership might look like, and also priority actions for the, for the new Consumer and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, that process it was an adaptation of um, World Cafe, so people got to, to participate with um, people they knew and also people they didn't know, with some briefing around um, what, uh, what, were the, what was the existing um, environment in terms of the principles uh, at play in this Transforming Health Program. Also, uh, what might be the, an appropriate membership, and also um, some ideas about priority actions. This really, um, <coughs> the, the, the principles that the, the that 
participants in that workshop identified was really heartening. Uh, it, it really shows the value of consumer community engagement, of um, informing people about uh, what the situation is, but also providing an appropriate environment in which they can um, suggest you what are the principles you want to be working against. And the top ten principles in our in order was that uh, the work in this space should be consumer-centred and directed, that it should include an authentic partnership, not tokenism, there should be accountability, there should be diversity, equity, accessibility. Evaluation came up quite strongly and um, finally at the end there, wellness and prevention. Those principles were developed by participants at the workshop and um, we've tried to follow through with them and we've adapted them into priority actions, which I'll speak to in a, in a little bit. Um, that's a word cloud of those principles. I haven't adjusted them in any way, as I've now found out you can with word clouds, but that's from the, report, <laughs> the final report and the discussion about the principles. Um, but you can see how accountability came, came up quite high. Diversity was important, partnership, um, and uh, centred meeting consumer-centred. Uh, we, we looked at potential committee membership and that's just a kind of a map or diagram of um, <coughs> priority populations and communities that were considered, the peak bodies in South Australia that could be considered, our local health network or health districts, um, the governing councils, also local health, council, health network uh, consumer councils and um, again priority populations and communities. So, so there was a, a vast set of, um, diverse set of uh, groups and interests that we wanted to, to try and include in the committee, but also we didn't want a committee that was, um, that had 30 seats around the table, 30 or 40. That's just unworkable. So we, we landed on having a selection process and, and having um, selection criteria, which uh, that workshop um, helped us to, to really develop. We also landed on having a mixture of individual community representatives, but also working with, with existing networks and peak bodies. So, so each uh, local health network, there's five in South Australia, they have um, nominated a consumer representative to the, to the committee. That uh, consumer representative has a responsibility for, for being a bridge, a, a communication channel back to the consumer council in each local health network. Likewise, we've engaged with um, the peak bodies, such as um, Council of the Ageing, Carers SA and the Multicultural Communities Council and, and they will have a seat at the table. There's a picture of some of the members there. Um, we meet once a month and um, in the middle there we've got um, uh, Dorothy Keith who's a clinical ambassador. One of the things this committee sought to do is to, to partner with um, people of authority uh, who actually are the decision makers involved in this transformation process. So, so we've done that and um, we've had Dorothy out to to our committee a number of times and um, since then we've also had the, the Chief Executive of SA Health out to our committee. That, uh, that partnership and, and building that uh, relationship with those decision makers has been key to, 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 to building the confidence of the committee but also to, to delivering on um, the committee's expectations. Um, the priority plan, action, the action plan priorities that, that came out of that first workshop um, the, the top six were consumer and community engagement, vulnerable populations, access as an issue, information provision, community education, evaluation and primary health and prevention. Um, they, are, they are in line with the, with the principles that were developed and we've been working over on those priorities over the last uh, 12 months. Now, um, what are some of the challenges we've, we've encountered in this? This is actually a very... Um, it's a high profile change program for, for the state government. Uh, it's become very politicised uh, almost from day one. Um, and there, there's a lot of partisan politics at play in this process. Um, there's been high expectations of the significance of the reform. It was described initially as a burning platform um, and it's the only agenda in town if you're talking to, to the health department. Init at the start of this process, the minister and the department could be described as being uncomfortable with consumer participation. There's a lot of reasons around that, but um, I think that was a very genuine um, expression of where things were at at the start of this process. And it was shown by the, the way that our consumer advocates were really excluded in that first year of development of this program. Um, there's also the risk adverse nature of government, and particularly um, the head office of uh, the health department, and you can see this across Australia. I think I've worked interstate and I've, I've certainly noticed it in other state head offices. Um, 
are conservative in their communication strategies, there's a lot of controlling behaviours, uh, there's a lack of openness, transparency and trust. I'm beginning to see some of that is really turning around now, but that was the situation for the, really the first year of the work of the committee. So we weren't even able to, to access the high level um, work plan for this major change in our hospital system, so it was quite difficult for the committee to adequately advise on consumer engagement strategies and, and, and community views without knowing what the work plan actually looked like in, in any sort of detail. <clears throat> there are expectations of the role of the committee, both from government, some parts of government, some parts of the department, and also from the Health Consumers Alliance itself, my organisation. Um, <clears throat> sometimes resources weren't, ma weren't matching expectations. Uh, and priorities, personnel and timeframes change. I mean, they do change. It's the reality in working in a, in a dynamic, complex system. Uh, but sometimes those changes led to disappointment. For example, early on, um, well, we had one, one um, non-clinical leader on the, on the program who committed to developing a consumer and community engagement uh, strategy. That was never followed from, but it was in writing, it's in one of the reports, and it was a commitment. Uh, but things moved and changed. I don't think some members of the committee's uh, expectations uh, kept up with the changes that were occurring. So there was a fair bit of disappointment there for some individuals. We have a diverse membership, which is great, but also that leads to different expectations and um, you know sometimes some conflict around what their role is at the, in the committee uh, against what the whole of the committee might consider their role to be. So some people felt very uncomfortable that the committee might be seen to be endorsing the government program instead of um, working with the program in a different way. So there, I've described that further, community views and individual views can differ. Um, <coughs> it's um, not unusual on issues of, of significant political sensitivity. Yep. Um, <coughs> increasing poor profile with this change program in the media, every problem in the health system is now blamed on this program. So it's um, <coughs> virtually a day doesn't go by without being in the the print media. Good thing not much of the population reads that print media anymore, but um, <coughs> there's still a lot of good in this program, which is why we're still um, working on it. And also um, health staff and consumer representatives have been subjected to, to personal abuse, um, and the police have been involved in some situations for, for health staff. It's become that hot, the debate and um, uh, culture around this change program. <coughs> there's a picture of the committee at work, um, the opportunities, we've seen an increase in consumer participation in the health system reform. Um, we've improved the perception of consumer participation. We've improved the standing of consumer movement in the eyes of decision makers. We've um, <coughs> increased the standard. We've got a standing consumer focus group for SA Health to use if they want to on, on this change program. And we've increased the sense of the active partnership with SA Health. There's also new executive leadership in SA Health and um, they're very keen to, to increase uh, the work of the committee and uh, see what we can realistically achieve. Enabling factors include the ability of my organisation to assess the opportunities and risks in transforming health, to be agile and responsive to this significant change in the reorientation of our hospital system. I had a board that um, carefully considered the opportunities before us and the risks and um, they supported uh, the idea of pursuing the reform and um, put out a public position paper statement about that. We did receive one-off funding to establish a committee. Uh, we had participation from SA Health staff in the committee's partners. And uh, having the principles, the selection criteria and priorities established uh, to establish the committee has been borne out to be a very useful way to go about uh, doing such a, such a piece of work. We worked with existing consumer networks and organisations. Um, that's a picture, that's our uh, chief executive of our health department, uh, Vicky Kaminsky, so from Canada, but um, she, she's now there at the committee. So um, that's been a significant change. Um, we never saw the previous uh, executive, but uh, she's been at the committee. She's sending her deputy CEO to committee meetings now regularly. Uh, we've really got that, that sense of partnership and participation from the health department. Um, working with the decision makers has been vital to to, to get a sense of achievement in, in this work. So if you're interested in more information, we've got a website which has a Transforming Health page with a number of documents to, documenting this history. There's also a page for the SA Government and you can follow us on Facebook or join our email list. Thank you. Thank you.